I have five different setups for astrophotography here, and tonight they are all going to be centered on one patch of sky, the core of our Milky Way galaxy, in an epic one-night shootout. The contenders are using your smartphone with a DIY hand turn tracker, a basic DSLR and kit lens on a tripod, a basic DSLR and fast telephoto lens on a motorized star tracker, a modified DSLR and a small refractor telescope on a budget go-to mount, and lastly, a dedicated mono camera with LRGB filters in a motorized filter wheel and a premium refractor with an automated focuser all on a heavy go-to mount. Welcome, my name is Nico Carver and I'm interested in helping people explore this wonderful hobby we call astrophotography, which simply means photographing the night sky. Tonight, I'll show you some different approaches to astrophotography in terms of the, the gear that you may choose to use to shoot the night sky. And I'll walk through how each system works, how you set each one up, uh, to get the best results possible. And of course, we're gonna compare the final images that I've produced with each kit all in one night. This is a shootout in the sense that the other night I shot the same patch of sky with each kit, but it's by no means a scientific test as the systems are just too different in nature to try to like closely match settings. Um, so it's not apples to apples here, it's more apples to oranges to passion fruit, uh, but that's the point. For fans of short videos, this is probably not going to be one of those, but check out my channel and subscribe um, because I've been putting out a lot of shorter videos recently, including a series you may have seen of five minute and under videos every Friday that I'm calling Five Minute Fridays. First off, I wanna give a huge thank you to High Point Scientific, which is a great online store for all things astronomy and astrophotography. They have telescopes, mounts, cameras, accessories, really everything that you'd need to get started. And this is not sponsored by them, meaning that no money is exchanged hands, but in my request, High Point Scientific did lend me the Skywatcher EQM35 mount and the Apertura 72 millimeter refractor, which came with a matching field flattener. And this is a huge help because going forward with this channel, I can't afford to buy everything that I wanna review and show you in these videos. Um, but that said, everything else in this video are things that I've personally bought over the years. You know, I really have way too much stuff, but I can always do more giveaways. I wanted to say that a number of these cameras and the Skywatcher Star Adventure and things like that are things that I've bought specifically for this channel with proceeds from my Patreon campaign, which really keeps this channel going. So another huge thanks to everyone who supports me over on Patreon. It's uh, patreon.com slash nebula photos. And if you're interested, it starts at just $1 per month. And there's tons of benefits in joining my community over on Patreon, including participation in imaging challenges, uh, exclusive giveaways, exclusive channels on my Discord server, uh, Zoom chats, all kinds of stuff. The first kit uh, we're looking at here may look a little bit strange if you're new to amateur astrophotography or new to my channel. This is a device that I built to manually track the night sky. Uh, it costs about $30 in parts to make the tracker. And if you're interested in building it, um, I have a video for that, of course. I'll link it in the right corner here and also in the video description. The rest of the $100 for this kit is used for buying a sturdy tripod that I got, uh, you could get used, and a clamp for your smartphone. I'm not including the cost of the smartphone itself Itself, um, because I'm guessing most people have access to a phone or some kind of camera. Another thing I wanna point out with this kit is I call it the DIYer because my thinking with this one is just, you know, trying to get the most out of things you have around the house or can build for pretty cheap, which is why I don't include the cost of the smartphone itself. Um, because it, I, the point is really just use any camera you can get your hands on, whether it's in a smartphone or a point and shoot or whatever it is, and put it on top of this barn door tracker. And with any of these cameras, including the smartphone, it's worth seeing if the camera shoots in raw format and use that rather than JPEG, if that's an option. If it only shoots JPEG, that's okay too for this. Just uh, make sure you pick the highest quality JPEG option. Let's now go through the steps of setting up the DIYer. Thank you to Maggie so much for assisting with the B-roll here. 
Uh, so we start by putting the tripod on solid ground and pointing it roughly north or south if you're in the southern hemisphere. And then we put the barn door tracker on, make sure it's securely attached. And then the same thing, we put our phone or whatever camera you're using on top of the barn door tracker. Then comes polar alignment. In the northern hemisphere, a cheap way to do this is just with a basic sighting device, like a little uh, straw. I'm using a metal drinking straw here, and we just need to line up the the pole star, which is Polaris, in the you know, which is pretty close to the North Celestial Pole. Okay, then after we're polar aligned, we're just going to take the phone, point it at the center of the Milky Way, work out some of the settings here in the camera app. Uh, the app that comes on my Huawei phone is very good for giving me pretty much full control over the settings in Pro mode. But if your native camera app isn't very good, just check out the your app store or the Google Play store. As there are a number of um, alternative apps these days, I've heard um, about Nightcap camera for iOS and Deep Sky camera for Android are two uh, really good apps I've heard. Okay, let's talk about the pros and cons of this kit. The pros are it's inexpensive, uh, especially if you're using a camera you already have around like a smartphone, it's very quick to set up, it's pretty lightweight. The cons are you're limited to very wide field, uh, both to, due to how the tracker works, but also just if you're using a smartphone, it probably only has like wide angle lenses. Another con, and it's sort of a big one for me actually, is that it can get sort of tiring and boring because you're manually moving the clock wheel uh, for the entire time. And this could be overcome by adding a small motor to the tracker, which is something I'm really interested in trying. Okay, the last con is that it requires a lot of tinkering to get good results. Both the manual barn door tracker and the phone required a lot of trial and error with both technique and with settings before I could really get anything that I liked. Um, and this isn't necessarily a con, it's just something to keep in mind. If you don't like tinkering, then this kit is probably not the one for you. Okay, let's look at the image I produced now. I'm pretty happy with it. The colors look reasonably good, the star color. We got some nice detail on the large dark nebulae in the Milky Way, and it shows off some of the other uh, kits in the bottom right corner here in the foreground that we're gonna be talking about. This next kit I love uh, just because of how simple it is, hence the nickname I picked for it, the keeping it simple. What you need for this kit is just any DSLR or mirrorless camera with the wide angle zoom kit lens that came with it. And we're gonna use the kit lens all the way zoomed out. So in my case, that's 18 millimeter focal length. I'm using a Canon T7 here, which is their most affordable DSLR. The only other two pieces of gear I used are a tripod. And again, I prefer a used tripod if you can get one from like a good brand. And then lastly, we have this super cheap little shutter release cable here. This thing is pretty great because it doesn't even take batteries. It's just a simple circuit with some wires and a little switch this button, which um, if you you know press it down, it takes a picture. If you press halfway, it focuses if you have it on autofocus. And then you can also lock it like that. And so I've used this before as a manual bulb timer, like just like lock it, wait for five minutes and then unlock it. Um, but a commenter on an older video of mine pointed out that you can just put a DSLR on continuous shooting mode and then lock the switch and the camera will continuously keep taking photos until you either unlock the switch or the battery runs out or your memory card fills. And I love this because it's simple and it does exactly what I want and nothing more. And I don't have to worry about what is interval versus uh, delay mean or that kind of thing. And it's also cheaper than an intervalometer. I don't have to worry about batteries since it doesn't take any. So the only time I still use an intervalometer is if I'm taking pictures longer than 30 seconds each. And that usually only comes up once you add tracking, which we'll get to next. Uh, setup for the keeping it simple is a breeze. You just plop down the tripod, add the camera, point it at a bright star or planet, manually focus by making that bright star as small as possible in the live view with 10 times zoom turned on. And once you're focused, you point it at what you are shooting, in this case, the Milky Way core, you lock the shutter release and let it take hundreds of photos. And for super wide angle stuff like this at 18 millimeters, we don't really even have to recenter that often. I always just recenter when I check focus, which Depending on how much the temperature is changing, I usually do every 20, 30, 40 minutes, something like that. So I think I recentered once during the night and I took like 600 pictures. Um, the settings were ISO 3200, 10 seconds exposure, lens wide open at f3.5. The reason I went to 10 seconds, even though that was a little bit past what the MPF rule suggested is f3.5 is a little bit slower than I'm usually at. So 
I wanted to get as much light in as I could uh, to bring down the noise. Here are what I see as the pros and cons of this setup. The pros are it's very simple and it's pretty low effort. The setup time is just very fast. You just need to focus, point it, Milky Way, start snapping away. It's relatively low cost. If you're a photographer, you might already have a camera and lens you can use and a tripod and uh, the shutter release cable. Um, and it's pretty easy to upgrade. You just need to upgrade the lens to get much better results. Now, speaking of the results, I'd say that's the only con is that the results aren't like super great. They're not that much better than the DIYer where we had the barn door tracker. Um, but the reason is I think because the kit lens is just a little bit soft. So you could consider a lens upgrade to get better performance. Um, you know, if you wanna throw money at it, or if you're a tinkerer, you could combine this kit with the DIYer. So if you have a DSLR, you can put that on the barn door tracker for $30, you have tracking, and that's gonna give you better results too. Anyways, let's get to the final image. This is the final stacked image that I made with the kit. The, the kit lens is, you can see, really bloats the blue stars. Some people actually, I think, find this pretty. I think that it is okay. It makes them a little bit overpowering though. But all in all, you know, it's a nice picture of the Milky Way core. And I think shows a little bit more detail than the smartphone shot. Okay, the name of this one is, of course, a little bit, you know, tongue in cheek. It's, it's, but it's true that many people who go as far as getting a small star tracker, like the Skywatcher Star Adventure, I found, get really hooked on astrophotography because they realize how fun it is. And so then they spend a lot more eventually to get the full go to mount and telescope, which is what we'll cover next. But the Gateway Drug is a very capable kit that opens you up to many new possibilities since. The Star Adventure can track the night sky with not just a wide angle lens, but a telephoto lens. And in this case, I'm using a prime telephoto called the Rokinon 135 F2, which is a great value for astrophotography. I got mine for $450 when it was on sale. They go on sale frequently. And the reason it's a great value is because it's pretty sharp, wide open at F2. It's pretty amazing. The Botanov mask and the USB dew heater strip are optional but they don't really add too much to the cost, especially if like me, you can 3D print your Badenov mask from a friend or a library. The Badenov mask, if you're unfamiliar, is a focusing aid that works well with telephoto lenses and with telescopes. And you just point it at a bright star and you, you line up the central line with this X pattern that the, the star forms when you put the mask on. You have to remember to take the mask back off, but then you have perfect focus. The dew heater is to keep the lens from fogging up. Really, we could use this on any of the kits, but I'm just, with this kit, since we're like a little bit more advanced, I think you probably should get the dew heater, especially if you are in a place with high humidity or if you're gonna be pointing the lens more up. If the lens is pretty perpendicular, then the, then the, um, the lens hood usually can prevent most dew from falling on the glass. Um, but in, in the summer, I do recommend a dew heater. This setup is a little bit more involved. Uh, we need to get everything securely attached. The Star Adventurer goes directly on the tripod legs, and then we put this thing called the declination bracket in the clamp on the Star Adventure. Finally, the camera and the lens go on top of that. Then we need to make sure that it's balanced between the camera and the counterweight. This is so we don't put too much stress on the gears, which are turning everything. After that's done, uh, we look through a tiny little telescope built into the tracker called a polar alignment scope. And this is how we line it up with uh, the North Celestial Pole or the South Celestial Pole. With polar alignment done, we then turn to focusing the main lens. And this time, like I said, if you have a Badenov mask, you can use one. If not, just make the stars as small as possible. We then point the telescope at our target. Unlike the previous two kits, we now need to do a bit more of a precision pointing um, because to get it framed up how we want. Because we're not just pointing at the Milky Way, we want to point at the really interesting part, which for me is the lagoon and Triffid right in the center there. And so uh, this can be frustrating to, to know how to point and how to find things in the night sky. It's a learning process, it takes many nights, but I do have a video on some tips to use technology to help you out a little bit, but don't expect to be great at it right away. Okay, with all of that done, we've taken a test shot. We know we're pointed correctly. We're in focus. We then turn on tracking on the Star Adventure program, the intervalometer to take, let's say, 100 shots. And after about 100 shots at 30 seconds each, that's time that I'd like to check focus. If focus looks good, then I'll take another 100. If not, then I'll refocus and then reprogram the intervalometer, take another 100 then. At the end of the night, we're gonna take our calibration frames, which are our dark bias and flats. 
Um, with the flats, you do need some kind of white light source. So like an iPad works well, a tracing tablet, anything that's sort of flat and white, you just put that right on top of the lens to take the flats. I go into a lot more detail about how to take these things in sort of my start to finish videos. So I'm not gonna go into all of that now since this is just more about comparison and how you set these different things up. The pros of this kit are it's uh, still pretty lightweight and portable. Uh, you can definitely take it on an airplane as I have many times before, and it's pretty versatile. We could, we could use it for tracked Milky Way shooting with a wide angle lens, or like we're doing here, focus in on some large nebulae like the Lagoon and Trifid with a telephoto lens or a small telescope. It works with stuff you may already have, like it works with the tripod, it works with the camera and lens. So instead of spending, you know, the full 1500, you may just be spending 425 to get the Star Tracker. And I really like that the Star Tracker runs for a long time on AA batteries, very convenient. The cons are that the setup time is starting to get longer, especially if you're new to astrophotography, both polar alignment and finding objects at higher focal length can, can take a bit of time. Um, a last con is that I've heard from many that the Star Tracker is not available in their country. So it can be frustrating to see all these videos about how great it is and then and not be able to buy one. Okay, let's look at what I produced with this setup. This was 300 lights at 30 seconds each. So about two and a half hours total. I shot at ISO 3200 with the Rokinon wide open at F2. As I said earlier, I did get the calibration frames with this one. So 50 each of darks, bias and flats. And you can see we got some great detail on the Lagoon and Trifid Nebulae here, as well as the star field. Uh, the Rokinon lens, I think is very impressive on the stars, especially on a crop sensor camera, like I was using a Canon T7. This mounted telescope for, for this kit, the Giddens Sirius, were lent to me by the fine folks at High Point Scientific. And so um, this was only my second night shooting with this mountain telescope. I did a brief test a couple nights before to make sure it was all working okay, which it was. And then uh, this was my first real experience shooting with it. And I was very impressed by both the mount and the telescope. The mount again is a Skywatcher EQM35 uh, mount and it, it does have some faults. I, the accuracy of the go-to system with just the hand controller, what we'd call the pointing accuracy, it wasn't that impressive. But the tracking, which is more important to me, was, was great. For 30 second exposures at a focal length of 430 millimeters with this Apertura refractor, I was getting perfect stars every, every single shot. I didn't have any trailing issues. The stars looked great across the field. Uh, for the camera, I uh, got a barely used Canon T7 off eBay for 350, and then I had it modified for 300 from astrogear.net. And I'll be doing more of a review of different kinds of DSLR modifications in future videos. Now for the accessories, I decided to keep it pretty simple. We could have gone a lot with more stuff here, but I just went with like a dew heater controller, a dew heater strap for the, the telescope. I'm controlling the DSLR with an inner velometer, and I used a Bodinov mask for focusing. Now, you of course can add a lot more to this kit, uh, auto guiding, computer control, automated focusing, all this kind of stuff. But I was interested in just keeping it to the basics um, to keep it just sort of to the minimal kit for a telescope. And for, for me, this is the really the base kit that I'd suggest if you wanna get into astrophotography with a telescope. I wouldn't try to spend much less than this. Now to power it all, I was feeding both this kit and the next kit I'll show you off one big deep cycle lead acid battery, which is a pretty affordable battery given the huge capacity, but the downside of that kind of battery is that it's super heavy. Uh, the truth is though, um, I would never really consider this a portable kit. You really need a car to bring all this stuff to a dark site. So you couldn't hike with this, the, the, just the tripod is huge. Uh, so the heaviness of the battery doesn't matter too much uh, to me as long as I can safely lift it out of the car. Setup of this one is a bit more complex than the last one. It just, uh, it takes a little bit more time. We just need to get everything securely attached to the mount. We, we balance it, we polar align with the built-in polar scope, we turn everything on. And then there's a bit of setup. There is the hand controller setup. We have to feed it some information like our location, our GPS location. You can get all this information from a smartphone app like Polar Finder Pro. Uh, you just type it in here. Then we go through a three-star alignment process, and this is to train the go-to system. And it's, it's gonna point the telescope at different bright stars, and then you have to center them on your DSLR screen by pressing left, right, up and down arrows on the hand controller. 
Now, even after I did this, the go-tos were still about a degree off. And um, so I really should have brought like a Telrad, some kind of finder scope, because this could really get frustrating fast if you're doing go-tos and they're off. The caveat I'll mention is that this, is, again, was just my second night using it, so I could, maybe there's some way to fine tune the pointing. Um, one way, of course, is you can connect it to a computer and then you can plate solve to correct the pointing, and that's really fast and, and good. The pros of this setup are we can accurately track at 430 millimeters, which gives us a much more detailed view of deep sky objects. Another pro is that the mount can handle the weight of a telescope, and telescopes can be really optimized for astrophotography more so than camera lenses. It also has more potential for upgrades. We can, as, as I mentioned, we could add complete automation if we wanted to. The cons are there is much more to learn here before you can get good results, and the kit is way too heavy and bulky at this point to hike or fly with it. Uh, you, you, it's, it's really just like a you could put it in your car and bring it somewhere. All right, and here is the final image. I was super impressed by this. Not a huge amount of effort to get really nice results. This is only 159 lights at 30 seconds each, so under 90 minutes total at an F ratio of F6, ISO 3200. The, the star rendering is amazing. The field flattener is clearly doing its job as the stars look round in the corners. It's amazing to me that the whole telescope and field flattener is only $700 if you get them as a set because these stars look near perfect. I didn't see any excessive star bloat or color fringing. So I think this is gonna be really hard to beat, but let's see if the next kit can do it. This is my personal kit that I've been slowly adding to and upgrading parts over the years. At this point, almost everything in it has been upgraded at least once, and that's how I can afford something like this. I've never had this much money all at once, but I just save up for one new upgrade or thing at a time. Like if I want a new telescope, I can then offset the cost a bit by selling my old one. So to step through this, the EQ6R mount you may have heard of because it's just a tremendous value at around $1,600 for a mount that will reliably hold like 30 plus pounds and has re, you know reasonably good and reliable pointing and tracking the camera I'm using I also love it's relatively new to me but so far so good the QHY 268M it's a mono camera meaning I need filters in front of it and I use two inch filters from Aunt Leah and a QHY 7 position filter wheel I have LRGB and the three main narrowband filters being sulfur oxygen and hydrogen alpha for guiding I use an off-axis guider with the ZWO ASI 290 mini the telescope is a stellar view SVQ 86 that they only made a very limited run of in 2018, so I'm very happy to have gotten one because I love it. It has an aperture of 86 millimeters, focal length of 464, so that makes it a focal ratio of 5.4. Um, and then I have a bunch of accessories. The main ones are I have an Optech autofocus system, a Pegasus pocket power box uh, for power and dew heater stuff, and then a QHY pole master for its computer assisted polar alignment. The setup of this one is actually not too bad because I've really refined it over the years and keep most things connected to the top of the telescope. So I can just plop the whole thing on, connect a few wires, balance it, and then basically the rest of the setup is on the laptop. I have a whole video on how I do this kind of setup. It might need updating because I made it a few years ago now, but most of it I think is still how I do it. It's, it's still good information. I still use all the same programs I use then like EQ Mod, Cart 2 CL, PhD2, Pole Master and Sequence Generator Pro. I'm not gonna go deep into the software stuff, but I'll just say that there are so many options for software that control your gear that it can be a little bit overwhelming if you're a beginner. But I just suggest trying things out, seeing if you like them. Don't feel pressured to use something just because someone else does or something like that. Use whatever makes sense to you. For me, once I've learned a process that is giving me good data, I don't really feel the need to change unless I have to for some reason. Once I hit start, uh, start sequence on Sequence Generator Pro, everything is automated. It does an automated focus routine every half hour. It guides and dithers on its own. It changes the filters on its own. If the object, if the object I'm shooting crosses the meridian, it will flip the telescope to the other side of the mount so it can continue tracking. And this is really what you are paying for with something like this. It's, it's just a peace of mind that you can leave it alone you don't have to babysit it and it will be reliable, give you reliably good data. And for me, this is worth a lot because I can then work on big multi-year projects that I enjoy with my main kit while I'm testing things, making YouTube videos, helping friends, and just enjoying the night sky. So for me, the main pros of this setup are 
One, automation. Two, reliable data quality. And three, great narrowband data, even from the city. This isn't something I'm gonna really talk about in this video, but I have three nanometer Antlia narrowband filters for this kit, and that lets me image uh, from Somerville, where I live, which is Bortle 8, right next to downtown Boston. Now, the cons are this kit is very heavy and bulky, it's expensive, and it's complex. And the, the main problem with complexity is if something goes wrong, there are so many possibilities for what it could be uh, because there are literally dozens and dozens of possible points of failure with a kit like this one. But I've learned two things about complex Astro setups over the years. First one, I always bring extra cables for everything in your kit, you know, you want an extra cable. And if something isn't connecting or something's acting weird, try switching out the cable, because I can't tell you how many times that's worked for some reason. Uh, even if I don't think the cable's bad, changing the cable, then it works. The second thing is, once everything's updated on your laptop or your Raspberry Pi or whatever you're using, don't update the software. And I know, Sometimes you maybe you want to update the software because there's a new feature or something. If you have to update, do it on a new moon, see if anything breaks, if and then you know have a plan for rolling back to your stable setup if something goes wrong. Okay, looking at the final image, this is 20 luminance frames and 10 each of red, green, and blue, all at two minutes each, so a total of one hour, 40 minutes. I think the main things that make it stand apart a bit from the last image with the last kit is that it's already pretty low noise. And that's mostly thanks to this amazing camera, the QHY268M. The star color and the contrast in general are a little bit more pleasing to me. I mean, I'm sure I could match the two images better uh, in terms of color and processing, but I basically just did very minimal processing to show you more of the baseline differences between these different kits. And again, I don't think that in terms of just normal color image performance that the Lifer kit is worth four times more than the Get In Serious kit. It's really when you add in narrow band capabilities and all the automation that you start to get why it's so much more expensive for that sort of peace of mind. Now that we have a feel for each kit, let's do some comparisons. And let's start with the weight of each kit. Uh, the total weight of the DIYer is seven pounds or 3.2 kilograms. I can easily lift the whole thing with one arm, move it around. I'd say that it would be pretty easy just to strap it to a backpack and hike with it if you want. The keeping it simple is even lighter at 5.5 pounds or 2.5 kilograms, definitely easy to hike with. The total weight of the Gateway drug is about 13 pounds or 5.9 kilograms, definitely still can hike with it, but it's more than double the weight of either of the first two kits. And the total weight of the Giddin Serious kit is 31.2 pounds or 14.2 kilograms, and this is without the lead acid battery I used to power it, which alone weighs 59 pounds or 26.8 kilograms. This is the kind of setup where I don't want to move it and any further than I have to. The reason I separated the battery out from the, the total weight is because if the weight of the battery was a concern, you could definitely get a lighter battery. The big lithium batteries are still substantially more ex expensive than a lead acid, but I think the prices have been falling a bit in recent years and the lithium bat batteries will be much, much lighter, like around 10 pounds. Uh, the total weight of the Lifer is 103 pounds or 46.7 kilograms, and that's without the lead acid battery, which again is an additional uh, 59 pounds. So why a three times increase in weight from the Giddens Sirius? Well, the main thing is the EQ6R is uh, a good reliable mount, partly because they just make it super heavy. The mount head alone is like 40 pounds, the tripod is 15 or 16 pounds, and then you have 22 pounds of counterweights. And so before we even add my tricked out telescope, we're at about 77 pounds with the EQ6R. Uh, the good thing about it being so heavy is that makes it more resistant to things like wind and vibration, uh, which can easily ruin astrophotos. But the downside of it being heavy is that it's quite the pain to move it around. I live on a third floor apartment, so bringing all this stuff down and up uh, to the car every night I want to image is a bit of a pain. Another comparison that I find interesting is you know, from the moment that you start taking the kit out of the car till when you start taking images of the night sky is all what I'd call setup time. So we're gonna compare the setup times that I recorded for each kit. The DIYer required little setup, it was just sort of putting the tracker on the phone on the tripod, very roughly polar lighting, you know, aiming the phone at the Milky Way, finding focus. So with practice, the total for me has, is down to eight minutes with that kit. 
with all these numbers, keep in mind that I've practiced, I'm an experienced astrophotographer, so starting out, don't try to like match these. Um, it's really just a point of comparison between the different kits. The keeping it simple required nothing but focus and pointing the camera at the Milky Way, so it only took me three minutes to set up. The gateway drug required uh, putting it together, balancing, polar alignment, focusing, finding your target. And finding the target was a bit hard uh, the other night um, because I forgot all kinds of finder devices. So it took me 28 minutes, but I think if I had remembered a finder device, I could have brought that down to 20 minutes. The Giddon Sirius kit uh, required putting it together, balancing, polar aligning, setting up the hand controller, performing a three-star alignment, and then going to the Lagoon Nebula, but finding that it was off, so then having to really find it, um, and then focusing. In total, it took me 35 minutes, but with practice and a finder scope, I am sure that I could probably get that down to like 30 minutes. The Lifer is the kit that I use most often, and so it's very much in my muscle memory, and um, I also have tried to make the setup of it as efficient as possible since I do it so often. So I have it down to 16 minutes uh, when I go pretty fast. Um, I think the main takeaway from this comparison is, you know, especially with the Lifer being faster than the middle two, um, is that a more complex setup doesn't necessarily mean longer setup time um, because there's a lot of ways that you can make the setup more efficient. And one of those is actually controlling a lot of things through the computer can actually make you faster because plate solving, for instance, makes finding things so much faster. Another comparison that's semi-related is active time, meaning the time that you actively have to sit there with the kit doing something. And I'll, I'll measure this in terms of percentages. The DIYer is 100% active time because I'm actively moving the wheel to track. So if I get an hour of data, that means that I'm sitting there for an hour moving the wheel. Uh, with the keeping it simple, if you don't take any calibration frames and you don't recenter, it's maybe 0%, but for me it was 5% because I did check focus and recenter once. With the gateway drug, it just depends sort of on how much you check things, like how much you check focus and the tracking is working. Um, but I'd say it's somewhere between five and 10% because you're also, I also took calibration frames. It's the same exact thing with the Giddens Sirius. I, um, you know, five to 10%, something like that. I should point out though, that with neither setup did I feel the need to manually do a Meridian flip and then recenter and all that, um, because it didn't look like there was any danger of running into the tripod legs. Um, so I didn't do a Meridian flip, but if I had, that probably would have add to the, added to the active time. Uh, it probably would have climbed above 10% with either setup. With the Lifer, as I've mentioned, everything is automated, focusing, blah, blah, blah. So the active time is 0%. And you might be wondering, well, what about calibration frames? I do those at home with the Lifer because everything stays connected so I can even do flats at home. So there's, the, you know, after I get it set up, it's all, uh, passive. I don't have to I don't have to worry about it with that kit. Okay, we've made it to the final comparison, which is just the actual images themselves that I took with each kit. I'll quickly show each one full screen. Uh, and then we can look at some crops. I didn't really try to have any kind of consistent workflow in processing here. I just made them look as best as they could with simple processing techniques like curves and saturation after I stacked. Here are some crops now at 100% zoom. These are centered on the Lagoon Nebula, sort of like in my thumbnail for the video. And then now here is centered on the Trifid Nebula. Again, all of these finished photos plus my unprocessed stacked TIFFs for each kit is available at a link in the description. And I've also arranged these as kits with affiliate links um, to each item on kit.co slash nebula photos. And you can find that link in the video description as well. Hope this was helpful to you all out there. Since this is a long video, you're now seeing the names of all my Patreon supporters. If you wanna be in the credits to any long video like this, you can sign up over on patreon.com slash nebula photos. In addition to having your name in the credits, as you're seeing now, there are lots of benefits to joining us over on Patreon. I organize a monthly imaging challenge, which is a lot of fun. And the winning images each month are published on my Instagram and also on an Astrobin group. I also do Zoom chats where you can ask me questions live. We've been doing those on Sundays. So it's really worth your while to sign up so you don't miss out. 
Uh, well, till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies. <laughs> <laughs>